All right, everybody, here's the scary thing. I'm the host of the meeting now. Oh, nope, Ellie, you're back. Okay. Whew. I was like, that could be something I might be able to mess up. <laughs> We're trying to resolve some live streaming issues, Cindy. Aha. Thanks. Are you still the host? I see uh, Councilmember Marcano is listed as an attendee and the host can promote him up. Oh, Ellie's got it, I see. Yeah, you are super quiet to me, Victor. I don't know if that was the same for anybody else. Victor, um, I'm going to send host over to you. I'm having some issues um, where the buttons are not appearing on my WebEx. Okay, like the, like will, the promote button. I'll give it a try. Right. Actually, it's not. Letting me pass host either. You can pass it to me if you need to, Ellie, I can. If that's easier. I think that worked. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yep. Wonderful. All right. Sorry about that. Um, I do see we are at 102, though, and I think we've got everybody who's presenting here. I see Councilmember Gardner in the panelist list. So let's go ahead and call this meeting to order. So good to see you all. Thank you for joining us. Um, just want to move over to the approval of the minutes. Um, Councilmember Coombs, do you have any changes uh, to the minutes? Nope, I'm good. Okay, I'm good as well. Oh, and just for the record, uh, Councilmember Murillo will not be able to join us today. Um, so the meetings will stand, or sorry, the meeting minutes will stand approved. Um, seeing nothing under consent, let's move right into general business. And first up is Councilmember Gardner uh, presenting on Mexico City's bus rapid transit system. Councilmember Gardner, you've got the floor. Thank you, Councilmember Marcano, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity uh, to present. I know this was supposed to take place in August, and I'm sure everyone's been on the edge of their seat for a whole month hearing what I would have to say. So uh, now we will uh, open that package. So. Um, you know, I, I wanted to share a little bit about um, the BRT um, in, in Mexico City specifically because, A, I went there to learn about it, but, B, um, they have a very successful system as it compares to um, other BRT systems in other uh, parts of the, the United States as well as in other uh, places in the world. Um, but I just kind of want to – I know some of this will be review because obviously council and staff um, has been through – the approval process and the design and, and all that for, for a BRT system on Colfax, but um, I still think it's timely. And also, you know, if and when um, BRT uh, expands in the future or there are opportunities um, to make changes to uh, what's currently uh, going on on Colfax, um, I, I do think there's some lessons that I learned um, fr from their system and, and some things that I think make it successful. Um, and when I say successful, um, you, you know, one of the things I'm referring to is ridership. Um, and we'll talk a little bit um, more about um, Mexico City specifically and why it's so important um, for them to have a, a successful BRT and public transportation in, in general. So, um, so first, what is bus rapid transit? I know this will be reviewed, but 
um, bus rapid transit is basically just a bus based um, transportation system. And, you know, it, it, Mexico City already has a subway um, and a lot of the larger cities in the United States obviously have um, subway systems as well. Uh, but for cities like Denver and Aurora that do not, um, a BRT can be a really good alternative because it is significantly cheaper. Um, obviously, you know, digging holes through the tunneling through the earth and, and all that could get um, very expensive very quickly. And so um, a BRT uh, system is a good way to um, kind of get some of the um, public transportation options and some of the convenience of a subway system uh, while reducing some of your costs. So, um, you know, typically BRT systems will have dedicated uh, lanes. Uh, Mexico City certainly did, as as you all know, uh, Denver will, but Aurora will not on our portion. Um, and then also, is someone trying to talk? I'm sorry. And, and then also um, traffic priority. So what that looked like, um, and, and I think I have a picture of it specifically, um, but on the traffic lights in Mexico City, um, the they would have a BRT. It would, it would be a green light um, with the letters BRT, and that would turn green before the rest of the traffic. And so um, it allowed them, them some, some priority. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Mexico City specifically and, and why it's so um, important in a city like that. So one of the things I learned, um, I did not know, uh, this, but Mexico City is the largest city in North America. The Pardon Mexico me, Councilmember Gardner, if I can interrupt uh, you. Um, yeah. are, are you meaning to be sharing something right now? Oh, can you guys, I guess I th thought you guys could see my slides. I'm sorry. Yeah, I do know that you have a slideshow, but I just wanted to make sure. Uh, you does somebody have those that they could share? Otherwise, I mean, I have the PDF, so I could share it as I scroll through. Um, um, let me see if I can share. Yeah, you should be able to share, Councilmember Gardner. Um, and I can see. Oh, there we go. Can you go. see that? Yeah. Okay. Well, it won't look really pretty, like the only the slides, but at least you can see. Um, so, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, me uh, I didn't know that, but uh, Mexico City is the largest city in North America with a metro area population uh, of over 22 million people. Um, only about 30% of uh, the city has a car, but that's still 7 million cars. So as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of traffic um, and it's very densely populated. Uh, most, most of Mexico City is built up rather than out. Um, there are quite a few single family neighborhoods, but um, primarily um, there's, there's a lot of density. Um, their BRT system has a daily ridership of uh, 1.5 million residents. So um, obviously very, very uh, well utilized. Their first line opened in, um, in 2005. And, you know, one of the neat things I mentioned before, um, you know, obviously we don't have a subway system here in the Denver metro area, um, but they have transfer stations. And I'll show you a picture of one of those later um, that connects uh, both their bus system, their BRT system, as well as their subway system at one transfer station. Um, and so it's a very convenient way to, um, you know, to get around. You can go from nearly any part of the city to any other part um, and never leave uh, public transportation. Um, they primarily use side uh, running dedicated lanes. Um, there are some center running lanes. And so what that means is a, a lane, obviously, that's just dedicated to the BRT bus. Center running would be running in between the two lanes of traffic, whereas a side running would be on the side. I believe, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the BRT um, designed so far for Colfax in the Denver section is for a center running dedicated lane. Is that right, Councilmember Khan? Okay. Um, and then, of course, like I mentioned before, um, there will not be dedicated lanes in Aurora. Um, I have mentioned to some staff and, you know, I don't know what opportunities we have to change that in the future, um, but I think that's a missed opportunity not having um, a dedicated lane and, you know, really wish I had gone on this trip before we went through that process to to see it in action, because I think that that's um, it is a missed opportunity. Like I said, I did put on here um, some of the other cities, large cities that have BRT systems, as you can see, uh, Mexico City is the seventh highest in the world, um, but it's pretty um, geographically diverse. Um, you know, there's several on there, obviously, in, in South America, but then you have the Middle East and, and Southeast Asia as well. So um, it's, it's uh, BRTs are very uh, widely used in very geographically diverse places, um, though they tend to be most successful in, um, in dense cities. 
So a little bit more about um, the BRT system in, in Mexico City. They had a combination of two different types of buses, uh, some articulated buses. And so that's basically the accordion uh, that's in the middle of the bus, it looks like. And then um, a lot of double-decker buses as well, um, which, you know, when you're a tourist or whatever in a city, that's a kind of a fun way to see, uh, to, to see the city. But um, the the tickets um, work on a, pr a prepaid card, and so it's you know like the size of a of a credit card. Um, those are purchased um, by the the resident or the consumer or whoever, um, and it costs about seventy cents um, U.S. was was the equivalent. I did the uh, the conversion, and then you keep that card, and then you can reload it, um, and so it's intended to be saved and, and reused. And, and there'll be some pictures later on of um, the ticket purchasing machines and the, the terminals as you walk in. Um, a one-way trip, so anytime you get onto the BRT in Mexico City, you scan your card um, and you're essentially paying for a one-way trip no matter what the distance is. Um, and so as long as you, you can transfer to another line and as long as you don't leave the system, you stay in that line for your 30 cent one-way cost. Um, and, and again, that's, that's uh, US, but um, just for, you know, kind of informational purposes, um, we were there for four days, um, and it was, uh, I, I put about $7 on it and I never had to refill it. So, um, four days of, of, of getting around and it was about seven, less than $7 because there was, there was money left over. Um, some residents they have for free. And so that's going to be, um, seniors, disabled, um, and then as well as, kids, uh, so people under 18 get to ride the BRT for free. Um, and then they also have uh, designated women only seating areas that are dedicated or um, designated by pink seats. So um, some of these buses when you go in, and this is pretty common in a lot of cultures, we don't really see it here in the United States, but in a lot of other places, it is pretty common to have, um, you know, women only seating areas. And so when you go into these buses, the 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 um the door is painted pink meaning only women can enter through that door and then the seats are all painted pink meaning only women can sit in those seats and so um i i don't know that i got a picture of that but um just wanted to to point that out obviously not it common necessarily here in the us um so here is a map of their system and you can see it's fairly similar to what you see um, from a subway system in a large, uh, you know, U.S. city, somewhat similar uh, to our light rail system, though, um, you know, just a, lo a lot more um, going on. But um, this this um, kind of covers most of the, um, I guess what I would say, populated area of the city. I mean, it, it, it extends for a long time when you have 22 million people, but, um, you know, it's pretty easy to get just about anywhere um, the average person would go um, uh, along one of the BRT lines. And I'll show a picture here in a minute, but um, one of the things that they have done that has made this system even more successful is they have figured out that first mile, last mile issue. Um, that's one of the issues, you know, we deal with here in the metro area is our light rail. You know, for me, for example, um, I have to drive 25 minutes to the nearest light rail station. Um, so what they have done in Mexico City is they have, um, their system has bike racks, electronic bikes um, that you rent designed to drive back to your house or your apartment or your work or whatever it is. And then when you're done for the day, you get back on the bike, you drive it back, you park it on, and then you get back on the, the BRT. And so I think that's been a way that they've really been able to, to solve that you know, last mile, first mile, or whatever the phrase is, challenge. And I know that's come up a lot um, in conversations, not just about BRT uh, here, but also just light rail and, and other public transportation options. Uh, sometimes it's just not necessarily convenient for folks to get there. It's, you know, a 30 or 45 minute walk, and um, it can be it can be pretty challenging to navigate that. So, um, and I, I believe I do have a picture of that, so we'll, I'll show you that. Um, so here's a little bit about the station. So on the left, so this one right here, this is um, uh, just kind of most stations are look like this. It looks, you know, somewhat similar to a, um, a bus station that you would see here. Um, it's fairly basic. There's shelter seating, um, and and that's really about it. On the right, however, you can see this is a um, I forgot the word that we use, but kind of like a landmark station or whatever, but um, this is a transfer station between two different uh, BRT lines. 
as well as um, near the near the back. So kind of below right here, this these green signs. There's an escalator you can go down to the subway. So this serves as a transfer station for um, several different um, modes of transportation. So the pictures you see now, this, these are the same stations I just showed you, but kind of the inside of it. Um, so you can see on the left is kind of the, the basic station. Uh, however, it still includes a scrolling ticker um, that has information on when the next uh, bus will come. They come about every 45 seconds to a minute during, you know, kind of prime or peak hours. And so, um, it, you know, if, if you have a less crowded um, or a, a less frequent system, probably is a little bit more important to have that there. It came off as kind of silly just because of how often they come. In fact, there would be times where um, there would be two or three BRT buses waiting at the station because they are so frequent. Um, and so then on the flip on the right side, you can see the inside of kind of that transfer station, like I mentioned. Um, it's covered, um, but, you know, it's it's pretty similar in terms of um, function. There's ticket machines and uh, scrolling tickers and things like that. Um, but just wanted to kind of show both both angles of both of those stations. Uh, so here are the ticket kiosks. So on the left and on the middle, those are the ticket kiosks that were um, on the basic station. So when you walk up to the station, you can see the system map. Above it, uh, kind of that uh, horizontal map looks very similar to what we see, like for our light rail uh, system, obviously. And then um, on the, the left picture, you can see the actual ticket machine um, where you insert your cash and then the, the card comes out. On the right, the far right, there's three ticket kiosks, and those were the ticket machines that were inside that transfer um, station. Those obviously have a lot more um, activity, just a lot more people coming through. And so there's just more opportunities to purchase them. But in terms of kind of form and function, um, they were they were very similar to what we saw um, in, the, in the other stations. Um, so that is all that I had. I think I stayed within my 10 minutes. Um, I, I just, yeah, again, I kind of want to reemphasize, um, I think there were some lessons that I learned um, from from going on this trip um, and, and for um, uh, context purposes, since I, I think I forgot to mention it. Um, this was the downtown Denver partnership um, uh, urban exploration trip to Mexico City. Um, that was the trip that this was with. And so it was just a good opportunity to learn about a lot of transportation things in Mexico City, as well as, you know, just urban planning, design, uh, things like that. But I, I wanted to present specifically on the BRT, um, just because we obviously are looking at a project here. And um, you know, my hope, and I've, I've shared this with some of the staff, um, my hope is that we have the opportunity to, um, you know, look at dedicated lanes and things like that in the future, because I really do believe that that's part of what makes this system so um, successful in Mexico City. So again, thank you to the uh, committee for the opportunity to present and uh, happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for that presentation, Councilmember Gardner. And for what it's worth, I actually was really looking forward to this. So, no, good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see if um, I can stop sharing. Sure. Does, does anybody know how I? Oh, here. Uh, the, yeah. The big orange button that says stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, thank you. So, um, I do have a couple of questions. So this uh -huh. started, they started rolling this network out in 2005. Uh -huh. um, did y'all cover how much the overall network cost? Um, and basically like the return on investment in terms of um, motor vehicle trips saved um, and you know about what that looks like in terms of reduced uh, conventional infrastructure maintenance costs. Yeah, so the, the cost of the system varied a lot with the line that was built and that's because it has been built over so long. So I, you, as you pointed out, the first line was built in 2005. The last line, which was the one where you saw the pictures from, is kind of, kind of like their downtown corridor. I, I guess I would say most similar to like maybe 16th Street Mall. Um, and so that was most recent. And so the costs have just changed so dramatically. Um, but yes, they have had um, a significant reduction in both car trips, which has had several um, savings, but the biggest one has been um, uh, traffic um, in terms of like reduced trips on the road and, and things like that has led to less, fewer costs in terms of um, rebuilding roads and that type of thing. Um, so they've been able to realize a lot of um, of savings with that because even though the buses are a little bit heavier, um, it's still better than you know seven million cars a day. 
<laughs> for sure. And as you um, can see from one and a half million riders a day, um, that's obviously a significant reduction in, you know, the number of, of cars that would otherwise be on the road. Yep. Um, follow up on that point. Um, did y'all discuss the um, capacity um, on roadways? Because I'm going to assume that they repurposed some existing roadways for dedicated BRT, as we you were just discussing um, Denver's doing on the on their side of Colfax. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree that we should uh, consider doing the same on our side. Uh, granted, there's the overall capacity difference. We would have four lanes being reduced to two general purpose lanes. Denver has six being reduced to four. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna assume that they had similar circumstances in Mexico City with their network. Um, and I guess one, is that a correct assumption? And two, um, did they talk about how that impacted their traffic and capacity in those lower, uh, you know, the, the smaller parts of the network? Yeah, so a lot of the areas were, like you said, similar to Denver and that it was a six to a reduction to, to four. Um, in the areas where that wasn't the case, um, they either lived with, um, so, you know, by doing traffic studies, they could live with, okay, if we only have one dedicated lane in each way um, for traffic and one for BRT, um, based upon the system performance, we're accepting of that, or it was a matter of widening corridors when that was a, an available option to them. So it, it just depended upon, um, you know, the part of town, and it also depended upon um, what their expected usage was. They have so much history, though, that they've been able to demonstrate, um, you know, really high ridership. And so mm -hmm. when they go in, they can say, okay, we can estimate there's going to be X reduction in car traffic, and that'll be acceptable for the, the, the general purpose traffic. Yeah. So I do think that we have an opportunity to add dedicated lanes, maybe not in the really dense and built out portion of Colfax, but as we get closer to Peoria, I think we actually have the width. And then definitely to the east of Peoria, we have the width. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I mean, there, I will say, um, you know, obviously, urban planning looks different in Mexico City than it does mm. here. And there were some areas where it was pretty tight. Um, yeah, you know, so it's just it's different. But um, I think overall, um, you know, I think I told you, Councilmember Marcano. I mean, there were times where literal standstill of traffic um, because it is just so crowded, and the BRT just flies right along. You know. Yep. <laughs> That's a great advertisement for utilizing the BRT. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Well, uh, that, those are all the questions I have. Councilmember Coombs. Um, yeah. So I am familiar with the transit system in Mexico City, and you did a great job kind of talking about all the ways that it really helps folks there. But I do wonder um, what was your assessment of the impact? Because you talked about the 1.5 million a day ridership and 7 million people in cars. So that means most people get around with neither. So what was your assessment of kind of the impact of greater walkability and the general urban design and planning on yeah. their um, transportation? So I, oh, go on. I'm sorry. Did I cut you off? You're good. On transportation. I think you've got yeah. the that I was getting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, I have traveled, you know, all over the world um, to a lot of large cities, and I would say Mexico City is probably um, in my top two or three of easiest to get around cities, whether that's public transportation or walkability. Um, you know, they they have a very well designed public transportation system, but they also have, um, you know, well thought out for pedestrians. Um, you know, despite all the vehicle traffic, um, there were not times where I felt, you know, unsafe or, um, you know, whatever walking around. And so um, they, they have a lot of, you know, kind of wide um, sidewalk areas with green spaces and a lot of public art and things like that. But um, as far as kind of walkability, um, uh, yeah, it was one of the best that I have ever experienced. Um, you know, it's, it, you know, if, if, um, people had, um, like, uh, wheelchair bound and things like that, that, you know, probably wouldn't work very well in a place like Mexico city. They obviously don't have the same, um, ADA and, and other standards that we have here in this country, but I would say for the most part, um, it was, it was very easy, um, 
very easy city to get around. And I think, you know, one of the other things that I w wanted to see, you know, I, I can speak enough Spanish to kind of be dangerous or at least understand enough to be dangerous. Um, but I was curious, you know, somebody who has never been there, doesn't speak the native language, how easy would it be to navigate the BRT system? And it was easy, you know? And so I think that speaks to signage and maps and, and all that. And like I said, I can, you know, I understand some Spanish, um, especially when I'm reading it. And so I maybe had a little bit of more of an advantage than, than somebody who had no exposure to it, but it was very easy to navigate despite those challenges. And I will say other places that I have been in the world um, didn't feel as easy. Um, you know, even places like, like what's a good, like I, Stockholm, Sweden, um, they have a reputation for a very good public transportation system, but it was much harder for me to navigate as someone who, you know, doesn't speak the language and that kind of thing. So I, that was, you know, one of the takeaways I had, and I know it's something we've talked about with kind of the scrolling message boards and the kiosks and all that. And mm -hmm. I think just making sure that, um, you know, those are easy to use and user-friendly are really important because the more difficult you make it, less likely people are to use the system. Absolutely. Yeah. Did that, I think did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. I, and I agree, um, you know, even on very large roads in Mexico City, it's still the sidewalks and everything is designed so that it's a safe walk. Um, but also the point that you brought up of wayfinding is a really excellent point as well. I think that they have great wayfinding in their transportation system, and that's something we can definitely look to as we're looking at. It. So thank you, because I agree that it's also a time like presentation and I really appreciate you taking the time. Yep. Of course. Well, thank you very much for having me and um, have a good rest of your meeting, everybody. All right. Take care. Thanks. Yes. All right. Moving on to item 4B, consideration to approve a resolution for an intergovernmental agreement between the city of Aurora and the city and county of Denver for the Colfax bus rapid transit project. Hey, hey. <laughs> And uh, let's see, who am I handing it off to? Carly. Oh, you're muted, Carly. Or at least it's not picking up your um, voice. Got nothing yet. Okay, I've selected every microphone setting now. You got it. Okay. <laughs> it's the last one. I'm so sorry. Oh, WebEx. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, very timely topic um, with Councilmember Gardner's presentation. That was great. Uh, so let me share my screen. Make sure you guys can see this. Uh, looks like everybody can see the presentation. Is that right? Mm, yep. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Carly Camposano. I'm the traffic manager within the Public Works Department uh, at the city. And today I'm bringing forward an intergovernmental agreement between the city of Aurora and the city and county of Denver uh, for the Colfax Bus Rapid Transit Project. Uh, so this is a project we've discussed a few times this year, um, and Councilmember Gardner just gave a great BRT overview as well. Um, but this is an IGA uh, with Denver based on our, our previous presentations and discussions. And this, this IGA is just for the design phase of the project. Um, so that's the phase where Aurora is contributing um, funding for the design phase of improvements within Aurora. So that's what this is for. Um, so this is an overview of the project. And I know that you, you, know, you guys have heard this a few times before. Um, at least this year, we've presented this to TAPS uh, in March and then again in April. And then we also brought this forward to the study session for full council in May. Um, and based on all of that feedback and support from council, we've uh, moved forward with this agreement with Denver. Uh, so I'll just give a little bit of a brief overview of the project, um, as well as some of the, the history and then where we're at today and what this uh, what the design elements will include. Um, so as far as this project background, um, you can see the scope of the project. Um, on the screen here. So uh, this is these are the limits of the Colfax BRT project. So it starts in downtown Denver Union Station and ends within the city of Aurora um, at 225. And there are really three distinct segments that we've talked about previously. Um, the first is in the downtown area. Um, there's that loop shown in yellow um, between downtown Union Station and Civic Center. 
Um, and in that area, the, the BRT will be side running in the existing bus only lanes. Um, so that's that section in Denver. Uh, and then the blue section shown on the screen is over five miles. And that is within the Denver section. And that's where the dedicated lanes center running, um, like we've talked about, will be within the Denver section. Uh, and then the Aurora section is shown in orange, and that's from Yosemite to 225. And so th um, through that area, as you all know, the, the BRT will um, come from center running, and then it'll be side running mixed flow with traffic, at least for this project. That's what's scoped. Um, so that's shown here on the screen. Um, and just wanted to note um, that this is a regional project. Um, it's been planned for a lot of years, but it's uh, a collaboration between the city, uh, the city of Aurora, Denver, RTD, and CDOT. Um, so just a few bullets on the overall project history. Uh, this project has been in development for a decade now, um, and Aurora has been involved through various stages along with, uh, with Denver. Um, so there was originally a different alternative that included side running, um, eventually through analysis and every and you know public feedback that switched to center running uh, and then right now um, 2020 through 2022 uh, Denver and other stakeholders such as Aurora have been working through the environmental clearance process or the NEPA process um, which has included a lot of um, you know different elements to for the NEPA clearance such as a traffic study which is getting close to being wrapped up now um, as well as pretty extensive community outreach and stakeholder outreach um, so the, the NEPA process is all um, being done to prepare for an FTA small starts grant uh, and Denver recently submitted um, information to get get into the queue of the small starts rating application. And so that's really been the big the big push lately is to get into the small starts rating application. And I believe that was submitted last month by by Denver. So in the queue. Um, so what we've talked about before is, you know, what what improvements do we want to see in Aurora? And Denver can't use Denver funds uh, for improvements outside of their city. Uh, so with support from council, we've moved forward with some cost estimating and agreement with Denver, which is what this IJ is really for, to provide that funding for the design phase. Uh, so um, for bus rapid transit projects, um, through the FTA definition of BRT, there are certain elements that need to be included at a bare minimum. And so those improvements will be included at all Aurora stations. Those include 15L or shelters, I should say, similar to what's out there with the 15L right now as shown in these pictures and you guys have probably seen. <clears throat> um, but these come with weather protection, benches, trash trash receptacles, um, lit maps and schedule displays, but they only have to be static. They don't have to be variable. Um, and then different branding elements as well um, to really let you know that this is a, you know, this is a special facility. This is not just a typical bus. Um, so those will all be included at, at a minimum. Um, and then through feedback from you all for the, through the various TAPS meetings, as well as full council, um, staff move forward with recommendations for additional enhancements beyond the minimum for the project within Aurora. Uh, so those elements include uh, a signature station uh, at Havana, which, is, which will be very similar in aesthetics to the stations that are in the Denver section, um, ticket vending machines at all stations, uh, variable message signs showing the real-time bus arrival time at each station, uh, emergency phones, security cameras, and lighting at all stations, and then level boarding at some select areas. Um, and these areas were chosen by staff um, and as well as Denver based on a lot of it was physical constraints, where do we think we can fit it in, as well as ridership data from the 15 and 15 outlines that was already available showing you know who was boarding and how often did the bus have to kneel down for um, people with mobility devices. Um, so, based on all of those elements, we, we've worked with Denver to prepare cost estimates. Um, that got us to a number of what we expect construction funding to be. Um, and then a, a portion of that um, needs to be allocated for design, which will kick off very soon. Um, and we plan to provide this funding to, to Denver this year, um, which is will happen after this IGA is completed. Um, so, this IGA is for our 2022 cost for design which is the $2.33 million. Um, so uh, the rest of the costs and the project, uh, as far as construction and maintenance, those items will be handled in separate IGAs and we'll have a lot better numbers nailed down after the initial design effort is completed. And then also pending success of the small starts application. Um, we think that there's a pretty good chance that the grant will be awarded, but it's 
not uh, it's not technically awarded yet. So assuming the grant um, is awarded to the project, um, then we would move forward with the future project phases, which is the construction funding, um, which could be phased over multiple years, as well as the maintenance agreement. So this IGA is for the 2.33 million for design. Um, this is just an overall project timeline. Uh, so as I said, we're working on the preliminary engineering uh, right now. Uh, the FTA small starts rating application was submitted by Denver. So they're in the approval cycle for that. Um, the final design will be entering in um, very soon. So that's 2023 slash 2024 for about an 18 month period. And that's what the IG is for. Um, and then after that, uh, there'll be the construction application process, um, bidding, construction, bus acquisition, all of the testing associated with that, um, with the eventual goal to have the BRT service startup in 2028. And with that, the question for you all is, does the TAPS committee support moving this resolution for an IGA between the city of Aurora and city and county of Denver for the bus rapid transit project forward to the next available study session? And all right. questions, obviously. Yep. Thank you so much for the presentation, Carly. Um, I do have two questions. Um, and one is, um, can you refresh my memory? Do the BRT buses have the ability to kneel as well? Yes, they do. Okay. Good. Uh, and then two, who's handling the trash removal at the stations? That's a good question. Um, I, Gosh, who's handling the removal right now? I don't think it's the city. I think it's either RTD or their, their consultant. But um, Huang or Victor, would you... Do you have an answer for that? Do you know exactly who's removing the trash right now? You guys are on. Yeah, thanks, Carly. Victor here. Um, if the uh, location has advertising, it's our uh, third party vendor, uh, yeah. I believe, through that contract. Um, if not, I believe it may actually be RTD. Okay, interesting. I know we've had some issues um, with existing stations. Um, where our advertisers are responsible, but they just let trash pile up and it looks awful. So, all right, well, thank you for that. And I don't have any further questions, Council Member Coombs. Um, yeah, so it sounds like Ellis may have some questions along with me. <laughs> uh, we'll see, so they do not anymore. Uh, <laughs> so one question, one thing that came up in a conversation about accessibility in BRT was, the issue of the size of the gap um, between kind of curb and boarding um, for wheelchairs to be able to board safely. And so I don't know with respect to the design how we're going to be managing those types of accessibility features. Um, I know that the current light rail, like they have to come out and let a ramp down for you, whereas with the buses, they kind of let their the ramp down electronically, so it's not as onerous. So I just wasn't sure what the accessibility plans were for um, wheelchair boarding. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that we, at least, I don't know that I've talked about that specifically with the project team yet. Um, I know that Denver and RTD are working on the specifics about how the buses will be, will be designed for the project. Um, and yeah, I've, I've also recently seen on, on some of the light rail lines that, you know, the driver or somebody staff has to come out and like take the ramp out for somebody to board. Um, so I'm not sure, I know it will be accessible and they'll account for that, but I don't think that we know the exact um, design that'll be used quite yet. But we can also research that and have a better answer for study session as well. Okay, yeah. I mean, I think it's more of just a general as we move forward, making sure that, um, you know, that it's a smooth boarding process for folks using the ability to that. Yeah, no, I agree. It definitely needs to be as smooth as possible. And, you know, we don't want to disrupt the service. And we also don't want people to have to, you know, wait for somebody to go out and roll something out if it takes too long. So. But yeah, that's definitely an important consideration. All right. Um, so no further questions, Council Member Coombs? Correct. Yeah. All right, great. So uh, I am great with moving this forward. Any objection? No. Nope. I right. fully support. Thank you all so much. Same. Yes, very excited for this. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Yep. All righty. Um, so section five, miscellaneous matters for consideration. 
I don't see any on there. Does staff have any comments or anything that they want to toss in here? This isn't really, a, well, it is a miscellaneous matter. I wanted to let you know that um, for November and December, uh, the policy committee falls on the holidays. <clears throat> Sorry, so didn't know if we wanted to, uh, but maybe next month select an interim date um, so that we don't meet on Thanksgiving. Um, or Christmas Eve, <laughs> I think, is the other one. So. I think that's a very reasonable ask. <laughs> yeah, we can uh, set those dates uh, next month uh, okay. when Council Member Murillo will hopefully be able to join us. So, Great. all right. Um, so, anticipated topics for our next meeting. Uh, yes, Council Member Victor Rochelle here. Um, we actually have uh, quite a few topics uh, currently. All right on the list um i've got uh, a grant updates uh, regarding the tip call two three and four and federal grants um traffic signal controller iga with cdot uh an ev corridors discussion right. again with cdot where they're looking for some support um i have a topic uh, all things snow which includes a summary of the 2021 and then also moving forward into 2022 2023 plan um and then last, I currently have on the draft agenda, the Colorado Energy Office and e-bikes. Awesome. Oh my gosh, I'm excited for this next meeting. All right. Can I, can I have <laughs> one Cindy's item, please? Yeah, I think we need to, um, Mac and I, we had talked previously, Mac, about bringing Arapahoe County's request to participate in the microtransit, um, a grant that they were awarded, and we wanted to bring that next next month to give you a, an update and a, an ask for a little bit of funding. Right, thank you, Cindy, for that. Uh, that would say countywide uh, transit and micro transit uh, mobility um, uh, overall ass assessment uh, and uh, in the city's uh, role and and function in that. Thank you. Great, looking forward to it. All right. Um, so next up, are we good for October 27th at 1 p.m.? That works for me. Yeah, that works for me as well. All right, great. And hopefully that works for Councilmember Murillo as well. Uh, and seeing no further business, we are adjourned. Thank you all so much. Take care. We'll see you yeah. soon.